In earlier discussions, we noted that the singlet and triplet wave functions are orthogonal. And this raises the question of how intersystem crossing is even possible. The singlet and triplet wave functions, after all, have zero net overlap. That's essentially what we mean when we say the wave functions are orthogonal. To understand how intersystem crossing can take place, we need to introduce some new interactions or perturbations that enable the singlet to convert to the triplet or vice versa. And in understanding these different types of interactions, not only will we be able to communicate mechanisms for intersystem crossing, we'll also be able to make predictions about when intersystem crossing is likely to be more or less rapid. And this comes down to an, a set of rules that actually were developed by a faculty member right here at Georgia Tech, Mustafa El Sayed, known as El Sayed's Rules. These provide guidelines on when we expect intersystem crossing to be relatively rapid or relatively slow. First, we need to say two things about quantum spin. The first is that spin is a kind of angular momentum. And so it is governed by the conservation of momentum. If a change in spin angular momentum takes place, we need to have a source or sink of momentum somewhere else to account for that change. The other thing we need to say is that spin is associated with a magnetic moment. This means that magnetic fields can exert an influence on spin, and we've seen this already in the vector model of spins where we noted that when a magnetic field is applied to a spin, it will process around the direction of the magnetic field. And so the interactions that lead to changes in spin that happen during intersystem crossing come down to either sources or sinks of orbital or spin angular momentum in another particle, a nucleus, for example, or another set of electrons, or an external magnetic field, which can exert an influence over the magnetic moments associated with electron spin. Now, to understand what needs to happen in terms of the vector model of spins for intersystem crossing, let's remind ourselves of what the singlet and triplet states look like. So here's the singlet state with the two electron spins anti-parallel, and here are the three triplet substates with the z component equal to zero, t zero, positive one, t plus, negative one, t minus. And any kind of intersystem crossing is going to involve the conversion of the singlet to one of these triplet states or vice versa. And remember that although these are in general degenerate, in a magnetic field, t zero, t plus, and t minus will be associated with different energies. So how does this work? Well, there are actually two ways we could imagine, for example, the singlet converting to a triplet state. So let's imagine that we're thinking about intersystem crossing in this direction from the singlet to the triplet state. This is very commonly downhill in energy, and it's often important to think about if we excite, for example, into the first singlet state, first excited singlet state. There are two ways that intersystem crossing can occur from the perspective of the spins. The first involves spin flipping, and this kind of makes intuitive sense. We can simply flip upward this, say this vector in blue, this downspin in blue can be flipped upward, and we can see that that leads to the T plus state. But there's another way that intersystem crossing can take place, and it involves what we might call spin rephasing. The idea of spin rephasing is that one of the spins slows down with respect to the other, and this leads to a realignment of the spins and a change in phase, a change in the phase angle between the two. And we noted phase in the vector model of spins as an important difference between the singlet and triplet states with 180 degree out of phase for the singlet state and in phase, for example, for the T0 state, and in fact, for all of the other triplet states as well. So spin rephasing, for instance, is gonna involve a net motion of this blue spin 180 degrees with respect to the red spin so that the T0 state is generated. So you can see how if we imagined or we took up a perspective on the red spin vector so that it was frozen in space, to convert S to T0, the blue vector rotates around 180 degrees. And this amounts to a rephasing, and it comes from a difference in the precession rates of the two spins. Now, in order to do either of these things, we need a source of magnetic torque, right? We need some kind of torque that is going to move one of the spins with respect to the other. And the different types of magnetic torques correspond to different mechanisms for inter-system crossing. Which one is operative in a particular situation depends on the details of the molecule, the system it's in, whether an external field is applied, 
so on and so forth. So the first torque that's important to consider is an external magnetic field. External magnetic fields, if they exert a differential impact on one of the two unpaired spins, can convert the singlet to triplet or vice versa. A change in nuclear spin can be used to power a change in electron spin. And so this is yet another source of magnetic torque. For example, a 1H nucleus, a uh, hydrogen 1 nucleus flipping in spin in the vicinity of one of the unpaired electrons in an excited state can result in the conversion of the singlet to the triplet. And here, energy conservation is important to keep in mind. If the inner system crossing is downhill in energy, singlet to triplet, then the nuclear spin flip must be uphill in energy or endergonic. Finally, and most important for the remainder of this video, a change in orbital configuration can power a change in spin state because orbital angular momentum can be coupled to spin angular momentum. And the basic idea of how this works is that when an electron changes from, let's say, a px orbital, let's say an electron is, is occupying a px orbital in a particular excited state, if the electron moves into a py orbital perpendicular to the px orbital, a change in orbital angular momentum has taken place, right? Say we've gone from m sub l equal to negative 1 to m sub l equal to 0 in the course of doing this. This change in orbital angular momentum can be coupled to a change in spin. And so just qualitatively here, roughly, we could say that an upspin electron in the px orbital could become a downspin electron in the py orbital. And this conserves angular momentum overall, since the change in orbital angular momentum is compensated for, we might say, by the change in spin angular momentum. And this is interesting. This is an interesting phenomenon that we're going to return to in a second that allows us to understand how a change in the electron configuration of an excited state, primarily whether it's n pi star or pi pi star, can be associated with relatively fast inner system crossing, since it provides a mechanism for spin flipping. Before we get there though, I, I do have to mention an important uh, empirical effect with a pretty robust theoretical explanation associated with relatively rapid rates of inter-system crossing. And it's the pretty simple observation that when an excited state has significant unpaired electron density on a relatively heavy atom, typically third row or below, we see enhanced rates of inter-system crossing. So compounds containing heavy atoms undergo relatively fast inter-system crossing. And in the inter-system crossing literature, this is referred to as the heavy atom effect, or HAE. It comes from the fact that if we look at the perturbation operator, or the, the Hamiltonian operator, that couples a change in spin to a change in orbital configuration, this equation depends profoundly on the atomic number z. The greater z is, the larger this term becomes, and the larger this term is, the faster inter-system crossing gets because a change in orbital motion at or near the heavy atom can more easily power, quote unquote, changes in spin. So the details here of the Hamiltonian are not super important. The only thing to pay attention to here is that z to the fourth appears, so the heavier the atom, the larger is this spin orbit coupling term. And I should mention, because I haven't yet, that this idea of orbital angular momentum powering or causing or serving as a mechanism for a change in spin angular momentum is known as spin orbit coupling, since the electron spin and orbital motion are coupled or connected. And we can look at some data to back up this idea. If we look, for example, at the rate constant of singlet to triplet inner system crossing, which is this KST term, for a variety of naphthalene derivatives. It's about 10 to the sixth for parent naphthalene, which is an aromatic hydrocarbon. When we start substituting with heavy atoms, chlorine, bromine, and iodine, though, we see significant increases in the rate of inner system crossing for these compounds in which we have these relatively heavy atoms, right? Bromine, iodine, chlorine, connected to the naphthalene core. In fact, similar increases in the rate of what we might call reverse inter-system crossing occur from the triplet state back to the singlet state. That increase in rate leads to a substantial increase in the quantum yield of phosphorescence as well, since the singlet state is hardly around long enough to fluoresce. We can see the fluorescence quantum yields going 
pretty much close to zero here, inter-system crossing is so fast that they immediately become the triplet state, and the emission of a photon from T1 to S0 then is phosphorescence, not fluorescence. And in situations where we're interested in phosphorescence, the heavy atom effect plays a very important role, promoting phosphorescence at the expense of fluorescence. For example, if we want light to be emitted over a long time scale, phosphorescence is generally the way to go. And incorporating heavy atoms can lengthen the amount of time that a molecule spends emitting light since the time scale of phosphorescence is so much longer than that of fluorescence. The other cool thing about the heavy atom effect is that the atom in question does not have to be directly connected via a covalent bond to the chromophore. There is an external heavy atom effect. Incorporating heavy atoms into, say, the solvent can have the same effect of increasing the rate of inter-system crossing, even though the heavy atom is not directly covalently linked to the chromophore. And the idea is that as long as there is mixing of the states of the solvent containing the heavy atom, with the triplet state of the perturbed molecule, then there is an enhancement of inter-system crossing. In effect, those heavy atoms in the solvent are involved with the excited state of the solute, and so the heavy atom can become involved in spin-orbit coupling within the solute. This table lists some data in support of the external heavy atom effect in which the researchers, Giacchino and Kearns, looked at the phosphorescence of naphthalene in the presence of a variety of heavy atom containing hosts. So it's similar to a solution type situation, but in a frozen matrix type situation. And the hosts were a variety of substituted benzene compounds containing bromines, chlorines, iodines, and various substitution patterns with biphenyl as a control. And you can sort of see the control has a very, very long lifetime for naphthalene. But when the heavy atoms are incorporated, the lifetimes plummet dramatically. And this is a result of the increase in inter-system crossing associated with the heavy atom being in the vicinity of the naphthalene. So we've just seen that some excitation electron density on a heavy atom can promote spin-orbit coupling and facilitate inter-system crossing. But there's another mechanism for inter-system crossing that does not require a heavy atom, and it is really summed up succinctly by El Syed's rules. Just to state them off the bat, l syeds rules suggest that in photoexcited organic molecules, in particular organic chromophores that have the capability of forming either n pi star or pi pi star excited states, things like the carbonyl, amine, etc., inter-system crossing is allowed and, and rapid, we should add the word rapid here, relatively rapid, only when a change in orbital occupancy occurs. And the mechanism by which this takes place is a change in orbital configuration from px to py is coupled to a spin flip. So it's spin orbit coupling with a change in the orbital quantum number, we might say, of the electron as it spin flips. So first of all, four possibilities for the excited state of, say, the carbonyl chromophore. Let's focus on that here. Singlet n pi star, singlet pi pi star, triplet n pi star, and triplet pi pi star. Now the Singlet to triplet interconvergence without a change in orbital configuration are forbidden. And they're forbidden for the reason we stated at the beginning of this video. The singlet and triplet wave functions are orthogonal. They have no overlap. And so in the absence of a mechanism or interaction to couple the two, they will not convert or will do so only very, very slowly due to very weak interactions. On the other hand, an electron moving from an n orbital to a pi orbital or a pi orbital to an n orbital can facilitate interconversion of the singlet to the triplet state or the triplet to the singlet state, actually. Um, reverse arrows are worth considering here as well. The reason this works is that the n and pi star orbitals are orthogonal to one another. They're at right angles, right? And so, for example, if an electron begins, let's say we start in the singlet n pi star state, and so the n electron is occupying an orbital that looks like this, that's in the molecular plane. I'm not gonna do a great job of drawing this, but consider a p orbital that's pointed directly out towards you. This is the n orbital that that n electron is sitting in. Let's say it begins with spin up in the n pi star state. When that electron 
changes from the n orbital to the pi orbital, a change in orbital angular momentum has occurred. And visually, what we can say is that the orbital has rotated by 90 degrees, right? We've gone from the molecular plane to occupying a region of space above or below the molecular plane. That's a rotation of 90 degrees. That momentum change needs to be paid for, quote unquote, or accounted for by some other change in angular momentum. And that can be accounted for by a change in the spin state of the electron that moved. So we've gone from, and you know, let's imagine the other electron of the n pi star state was spin down so that we started in a singlet state. If that electron is still spin down after this transition, then we've moved from a singlet to a triplet. And there's been a change from the n orbital with some value of orbital angular momentum to the pi orbital with a different value of orbital angular momentum. And the fact that these are different is the key. The orbital transition serves as a mechanism for the spin flip. The change from n to pi star facilitates or is coupled to the change from the singlet to the triplet state. And it's all about that electron that moves conserving angular momentum.